I have a lot of pictures. I want to see if I can educate you guys a bit about some lung difficulties that occur after transplant. Um, there, I'm not sure I have to do this, but uh, there are disclosures. I am going to be discussing what's called an off-label use uh, of a medicine called etanercept or Embril. So this drug is FDA approved, uh, but we, uh, it's not approved for lung problems, although we have used it. And Amgen kindly provided uh, the drug and some central pharmacy support for some studies that I ran uh, several years ago, although I did not receive any monetary income from uh, Amgen. I also have a couple of other disclosures. I like to talk, <laughs> especially about things I'm passionate about. So uh, I'll try to keep it uh, to a minimum today. And I usually disclose this. I'm a Yankee fan. I, I, I know it's a little tough down here, but at least people know we get all of it out up front, right? If you want to walk out, you can, you can go ahead and leave. Um, anyway, so what are some objectives today? So I'm going to spend, you're here because you're all transplant survivors, so I know you know this information, but maybe two or three slides introducing the concept of bone marrow transplant and graft versus host disease. You guys are probably honorary experts at this, but if you don't understand that, the rest of the talk uh, can be a little bit more difficult to follow. Then we're going to spend some time reviewing lung anatomy. What does the lung really look like inside, and how can we look at pulmonary function testing? I was just talking to Barbara, who was telling me about some of her pulmonary function tests. I want you guys to understand what some of that alphabet soup is all about, so we'll have a couple of slides to take you through that. And then we're going to talk about some lung problems that we can see. Some are from infection, some are not. Some can occur early, some occur late. Is the lung a target organ of graft versus host disease? I was just talking to Barbara about this. And then in the end, we'll follow up with some tests and procedures that may be completed to diagnose uh, lung problems and to talk about some of the hope that we have moving forward. So the overview of bone marrow transplant or blood stem cell transplant. Traditionally, there's been this feeling that more is better. You could give super lethal doses of anti-cancer therapy. This is followed by a donor stem cell rescue. We do know over the last 10, 15, 20 years, many of you have, uh, may have received a reduced intensity transplant or a non-myeloablative transplant. So you can cut back the amount of chemotherapy and irradiation that is used, but still infuse those donor stem cells, which could be life-saving. Now, the good news is that it's the only curative therapy for many patients. The challenging news is that there are several limitations to successful outcomes. Regimen-related toxicity. We, you guys went through this. This is no picnic. You can have risks of infection, bleeding, and organ dysfunction. We know that patients can develop graft-versus-host disease, the target tissues generally being gut, liver, and skin. I am a big believer that the lung is also a target early and late. Lung injury, that's why you're here, and dysfunction, again, as I mentioned, can occur early after transplant or months and years later. Could be from an infection or not. We're going to talk about that. And, of course, we always worry about the risk of relapse of underlying malignancy if that was your primary reason for transplant. So what do we know about graft-versus-host disease? And, and, and if I could ever begin to define it in just a slide or two. This is a quite complex process for sure. This is how I like to talk to my patients and families about it, however. I like to start with thinking about a lung or a heart or a kidney transplant, where in that case, people can generally get your arms around the fact that it's the patient's immune system rejecting the donor organ. You guys know that graft-versus-host disease is this problem turned 180 degrees. It's actually the donor stem cell graft, regardless of match, that can reject you or the patient, hence the term graft versus host disease. This has remained a major co uh, complication, particularly when your transplant is from stem cells from someone else. It can be life-threatening. It remains a barrier to broadening the scope and success of transplant. And it is always a risk unless you happen to be transplanted by an absolute identical twin. The damage, again, is caused by the donor immune system. We know that they're, they're called lymphocytes. Uh, these cells that kind of get transplanted with the graft, and they can go on, regardless of match, and find and reject some tissues in you, in the host or patient. And again, this target tissue, if there was going to be a test, you guys would pass this with flying colors, I'm sure, but when you're talking about GVHD, we're thinking about skin, liver, and intestine, but today we're going to focus on the lung. Now, the other thing you guys are probably 
uh, educated on is that there are beneficial effects of graft versus host disease, something called graft versus leukemia effects. These same T cells can be in your body and long after the chemotherapy and radiation is gone, they can provide surveillance to kind of go after and target residual cancer cells. This is a very powerful effect, but it's very tightly linked with graft versus host disease. And in fact, the overall goal of transplant, when you're getting your stem cells from someone other than self, is to reduce the damage of graft versus host disease, but facilitate the restoration of the blood and the immune systems and preserve graft versus leukemia effects. This is the holy grail for any of us involved in the delivery of transplant. Okay, so we understand GVHD a little bit, I hope. Now we're gonna dig in to basic lung anatomy. So how basic are we gonna get? Well, not too basic, here's a cartoon of a tree. Think about a tree, but more importantly, think about a tree upside down. Then you begin to think about your lungs. So your trachea or your windpipe is basically the trunk. And then you're gonna have major branches, just like of the tree, they are your bronchi. When people have bronchitis, we're talking about inflammation of the major branches of your lungs. As those branches get smaller and smaller, all the way down to the leaf buds, these are called bronchioles. You may hear the term bronchiolitis or bronchiolitis obliterans. This is why I want to give you a general idea. This isn't just uh, medical mumbo jumbo. It comes from the anatomy of the lung. So I'll take it a step further. Not just a tree upside down. Now we, we've missed it here because with all the rain, the trees are blooming, but a tree just before uh, we get to spring. This is the better idea of what the lungs are really gonna look like. So the, 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 limb, the leaf buds have yet to kind of burst. They've yet to bloom. And that's important to know because all the way down at the end of these twigs are something called the alveoli. So here are the lungs again. Here's your tree trunk or trachea, the major branches or the primary bronchi. Again, if you have bronchitis, this is what's inflamed. I'm gonna show you a cartoon of this in a second. As you get further and further down, as those branches of the tree go all the way down to the twigs, these are called bronchioles, and all the way at the bottom are the alveoli. They're the little, the little sacs at the bottom, at the very end of your branches of the lung, and that would actually be if you looked at a tree just in the springtime, right where those leaves were gonna bloom. So, this is a little bit of a complex slide, but I just wanna kind of take you through. Here is again a uh, picture of a, a human. You're gonna breathe some air in. That air is gonna go into the trachea or to the windpipe. It's gonna find its way all the way down those smaller branches of the tree or the uh, bronchial system. When you get all the way, this like, looks like broccoli, doesn't it? So when you get all the way down to those leaf buds, the alveoli, this is where the action occurs. This is where oxygen that you breathe in actually has to get into your bloodstream and the carbon dioxide which you want to breathe out that is in your bloodstream has to get in to the bronchial space. Then it goes all the way back up as you exhale and that's how we get oxygen in and carbon dioxide out. So, this might uh, put the hair on the back of your neck on end. Generally speaking, people don't like PFTs, even, it, even though it's not a very invasive test, but it's a little bit of a pain in the neck, right? So, but I want you to, I want to uh, kind of take away some of the myths about what we're actually measuring. So this is a little bit of a graph. And think about this line here being breaths in, breaths out, breaths in, breaths out. And as we are sitting here breathing, this is kind of our normal, what is called tidal volume. As the tech says, Mr. Smith, take a deep breath in. You are going to then take a deep breath in as far as you can, and then they're gonna say blow out as hard as you can, and you're gonna blow all of that extra air and gas all the way out so you can't breathe a blowout anymore. This is called forced vital capacity, or FVC. So this begins our alphabet soup. But again, tidal volume, normal breaths, take a deep breath in, blow it all the way out until you can't blow anymore. That measurement is forced vital capacity. The lungs never fully collapse. 
there will be some air left in the lungs. That is called residual volume. And finally, there is something called the total lung capacity, which is the amount of air that is in your lungs from your biggest breath, not only through everything you can breathe out, but also including your residual volume. That is called TLC. Unfortunately, not always like tender loving care, but you get the sense that this is how you can demystify, if you will, the pulmonary function test. Now, here's another graph. Don't worry about the alphabet soup here, but let's start here. Some little tidal volumes in and out, in and out. Mr. Smith, take a deep breath in, okay? And then blow out as hard as you can, all the way to you can't blow out anymore. Again, remember, that is called forced vital capacity. That is going to be one of the tests that is measured. But here's the other important test. FEV1, forced expiratory volume in one second. After that big deep breath, the machine will measure how much you are uh, blowing out in the first second. And this is another very important uh, uh, measurement. So what ends up happening, and here's your residual volume. What ends up happening? Well, when you get PFTs done, based upon how old we are, whether we're men or women, uh, and also size, there's going to be some predictive measurements. They're going to say, for this patient, in my case, it could be a pediatric patient, 11 or 12 years old, who is a female who has a body weight of X, we are predicting you should score at this. Then you give your scores and a percent predicted value is generated. So this is like a report card. So when my patients come in and I say, ah, you had your pulmonary function test, it's six months after transplant, let's sit down. Let's look at your FEV1. Let's look at your FVC. This should read like a report card. The closer you are to 100%, the better off we are. This is an opportunity for me to ask my pediatric patients, so you guys good students? And then you know, there's a lot of uh, you know, looking back and forth to their, to their parents. But we, generally speaking, the kids get it, right? They want to be close to 100%. So if we're 100% or 95%, we're scoring well. But if suddenly our FVC is 70%, well then there's something potentially amiss, okay? So again, these, I want to demystify this. There are specific measurements. It's a little bit of alphabet soup, but you want to know that your practitioners and your physicians are looking specifically at some of these measurements. There are predicted measurements for your age, your gender, and your weight. There's a percent predicted value, and this is going to read like a report card. Okay, so with that in mind, let's start talking about some lung problems. Uh, diffuse lung injury is a major complication after transplant, and this is either infectious or non-infectious. And this is not to make you nervous, but it is important. This can impact outcomes, and you can be cured of your darn leukemia or your lymphoma or your myeloma, and then we have a problem with the lung, and that is something that is unacceptable to me, to you, to any of my colleagues. These problems can occur early and they can occur late after transplant. As I mentioned before, about half of them can be from an infection, a bacterial, a fungal, a viral, uh, a virus. This could be obvious or hidden sometimes. Sometimes we have to go and do special tests that we'll talk about in a second to see if any of these germs happen to be in your lungs. This is also why you guys are taking certain medications, maybe fluconazole or Bactrim uh, or uh, uh, Leviquin. There's a bunch of medicines that your physicians may have you on to reduce the likelihood of infection. Now, what if there's no infection, but there are non-infectious cause of lung injury, either acute, I'm going to talk briefly about something called idiopathic pneumonia syndrome, and then some of the other chronic forms of pulmonary dysfunction that we'll get into. Oops, okay. So again, there's going to be some early forms. This is just kind of showing. This is months after transplant here. Some of those early uh, types of uh, 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 lung injury can occur within the first couple of months, whereas some of the late forms of lung injury can occur either within a couple of months or, in fact, several months and years after transplant. We're going to talk about some of this alphabet soup in a minute. So what are our dis uh, discussion points? I want to talk to you about some of the uh, clinical signs and symptoms of lung disease. We're going to compare and contrast the different forms of lung injury. We'll talk a little bit about what we know about what causes these lung problems, either based upon human studies or, believe it or not, we actually use mice to model human disease.
And then we'll end with an approach to patients with lung problems and certain treatment strategies to consider in future directions, which I hope will leave you guys with some hope that we continue to do more about this problem. So here are some cartoons. Remember the tree uh, and maybe the major, uh, 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 the trunk or the windpipe. And then here branching off of that is going to be a bronchus, the major branches of the tree. This is a normal, healthy looking bronchus. This one is meant to depict pus. This is when the bronchi are inflamed. Again, if you have bronchitis, this is what your doctor, practitioner, or nurse are trying to tell you. The bronchi are inflamed. They can have pus there. That could be from an infection, could be from smoking. We hope no one in the room is, uh, is smoking. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, but this is the idea of bronchitis. What if all the way down at the very end of the twigs, those area called alveoli, where gas exchange is occurring. What if they are inflamed? What if they're filled with pus? Well, this is when people say, I have pneumonia. This is the part of the lung that is involved. It's really the, the very lowest parts of the lungs that can also collect the fluid, bacteria, etc. So again, the more you know about, oops, the more you know about the anatomy of the lung, the more you can make sense of some of the medical jargon. Lung infections can be driven by bacteria, so sometimes uh, uh, you guys could be on ciprofloxacin, Leviquin, moxifloxacin. These are medications that can be used to treat or prevent infection. Uh, certain germs are called fungi or yeast, so many of us can be on fluconazole, voriconazole, posaconazole. Those medicines will help treat and present fungal infections. What about something called pneumocystis? Many of you should be on Bactrim at one point or another. Uh, other medicines include pentamidine or atovaquone, but these are medicines that, again, that can treat or prevent this germ from causing a problem. There are many viruses that can cause problems, CMV being one of them, EBV is another. Uh, there, sometimes there are good medicines we can use. You may have been in, uh, in the past on gancyclovir or medicines like that, acyclovir. We also use blood tests to kind of monitor our patients for the development of viral pneumonias. Well, what about non-infectious lung problems? These are problems that occur. The lungs get inflamed, but there's no germs that can be found. Well, there's an acute form of lung injury. Uh, again, we were talking about the incidence and whether it can be infectious or non-infectious, but if lung injury occurs early, within the first weeks to months after transplant, and we cannot find an infection, this is termed idiopathic pneumonia syndrome. And this can cause a big, big problem in our patients immediately after transplant. Many times patients need extra oxygen and, and many times also need to be on a breathing machine. This is an x-ray actually, which may be hard to, to interpret, but the lung should be black. The lungs are on the outside. This is the vertebral column or your backbone. This big blob here is a heart. The lung should actually be black. When they are white, like this is whited out, this is a lung that is very inflamed. And this is a very serious complication with very unacceptably high mortality rates. So this was an area back when I was starting my training, how I was so intrigued about how this rapid onset lung injury occurred, how it progressed despite the standard of care that we would deliver. These, our patients would go to the intensive care unit and really still struggle. I was equally impressed about how little we knew about what was driving this process, and then we had some opportunities to study lung injury using animal models, and I will show you some of that in a slide or two later. So let's get on to some of the chronic forms of lung disease. Bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome. Again, this is kind of alphabet soup on, on steroids here, a very complicated term. It is referred to as BOS. Uh, this is historically the classic diagnosis of GVHD of the lung. It's not necessarily a public menace. Uh, thankfully, the incidence of BOS is probably less than 25%. It has been known uh, since the 1980s in the early infancy of transplant. Now, how do you make the diagnosis? You have to generally have evidence for airway obstruction. You can get air in, but you can't get air out. And the FEV1, forced expiratory volume in one second, goes down. And this does not respond well to puffers. So it's, it's kind of like fixed asthma. 
Clinically, patients can have a dry cough, you can have shortness of breath, you can have wheezing, but many patients have no symptoms at all, and this is only picked up on pulmonary function tests. As I was trying to describe, x-ray findings in CAT scans actually show air trapping. Air can get in, but it can't get out. Uh, and this is kind of a classic finding on CT scan. This can occur any time after transplant. It's usually not an early complication, usually a little later. Risk factors include chronic graft versus host disease in other organs, antecedent or previous viral infections, and maybe the use of peripheral blood stem cells versus bone marrow. The treatment is generally the same treatments you may have received to treat or prevent graft versus host disease, our favorite steroids, right? There's no one in this dang room that likes being on steroids. Cyclosporin and tacrolimus has been used. Some asthma meds have been used. Azithromycin, which is an antibiotic, have been used. And I'm going to show you some other things that uh, have come into play more recently. This is a big problem when it is... Uh, uh, diagnose. And again, it's not meant to scare you all. I want you guys to be educated, to be empowered, uh, to understand what is going on with your body. So if these terms come up, you want to make sure you're talking to your practitioners and physicians and nurses about it. So this is a little bit of a busy slide. This is a biopsy of a lung. This is on pathology. This here is going to be one of the very fine twigs, the bronchioles in the lung anatomy. This is not normal. All of this here is scar tissue. And this should be open. Instead, it's got gunk in here. That's the obliterans part of it. This has progressed where there is a lot of scarring around those very small twigs in the lung. So let's look now at our pulmonary function test. Here's FVC, forced expiratory, uh, excuse me, uh, um, forced vital capacity, and here's FEV1. In this particular patient, their FVC actually scored pretty well, 80%. Not too bad when you're comparing it to 100. But on the flip side, the FEV1 was low, 43%. Everyone understands that that's not going to be an acceptable grade. And when you put a ratio of this number over this number, it's below or around 50%. This is what you see when you can get air in, but you can't get air out. The force vital capacity, the ability to take a big breath is pretty normal, but the ability to get the air out of the lungs is tough. The reason is, as I will show you here, is that you can get air in, but then if you have a little mucus plug here, when you're trying to get air out of your lungs back out, that little plug can plug up the airway and you just simply cannot get air out. So this leads to air trapping and uh, an increase in this residual volume. It can also cause wheezing and can also cause persistent cough. Now, does this have an impact? Yes, it does. And again, it is not to scare you. I want to just emphasize that bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome is something that we take very seriously. This is data from the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Institute from over a decade ago, looking at nearly 1,000 people. Uh, and if you didn't have uh, obstructive lung disease versus if you did, you could see this was actually impacting on our survival rate, particularly in patients with graft versus host disease. Now, again, these data are over 15 years old. So what has this done? It has raised the importance of this issue to healthcare providers so that we can now come up with better treatments for patients who suffer with bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome. So what have we learned? This was data just published a couple of years ago in 2014. And Dr. Palmer and colleagues found out, perhaps no surprise, that you can have decline in lung function if you are paying attention to pulmonary function tests that predate the onset of clinical symptoms, shortness of breath, cough, etc. And this was actually turned out that the only National Institute of Health symptom-based score, this was shortness of breath, predicted outcome. So an increasing score over time correlated with outcome. So what this means is if people are getting sick, when my patients come in, hi Susan, and they say, Doc, doc I, I'm short of breath when I walk from the elevator to your office. That makes me nervous, right? I, I want to ca capture those patients before the lungs actually get to that point. So it turns out here that this is um, FEV1, and this is time after transplant. So your ability to get air out of the lungs, this is over time when they track some patients, 
But this is only when they started seeing symptoms. This graph suggests that the changes on pulmonary function tests will predate the symptoms. To me, this was a paper that I published shortly after. This gives us a window of opportunity. If we are paying attention to our pulmonary function tests and we could start see them going down, even if our patients are not coughing or not short of, short of breath, this is now an opportunity for us to perk up our, uh, our ears and to pay more attention to what is going on. So if we're going to treat, we can do so before signs and symptoms of disease occur. Does that make sense? So another form of chronic lung injury, very close to bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome, but this is called bronchiolitis obliterans organizing pneumonia. Even easier to say, right? This is called BOOP. So you have BOS and BOOP. It turns out that this is a distinct form of lung injury. Again, thankfully not a public menace. Two to five percent, maybe 10 percent of patients. You can have cough and shortness of breath. The x-rays look different. There's fluffiness. It's not going to be the same as BOS. And more importantly, on pulmonary function tests, you can, the problem here is the lungs are stiff. It's not so much you can't get air out, you're having trouble getting air in. So many people actually exchange BOOP and, and, and BOS, but these are distinct problems. And as I was telling Barbara before, this is not necessarily recognized as graft versus host disease of the lung, although I'm a big believer that it is. One of the risk factors for BOOP is, in fact, acute and chronic graft-versus-host disease. This tends to be a little bit more responsive to steroids, but who wants to be on steroids? Uh, but it's a little more challenging to deal with after transplant. Uh, it can be used interchangeably with that other form, but it's not the same things. On x-rays, on PFTs, on CAT scans, and its response to treatment are different. And this is why, Barbara, I wanted you to know that I'm not sure. Maybe they're thinking you have more of this type of uh, lung problem than classic BOS. So let's go back to our PFTs again. FVC, that big breath in and all of the air out, and FEV1. Well, in this case, this patient can simply 70%, ah, depending on what kind of student you are, probably not happy with that number. It's the ability to get air in that's the problem. If you look at FEV1, that number is about the same. So this ratio is 100%. So this is not classic graft-versus-host disease of the lung as it's uh, standardly considered. However, this is a, an issue where the lung is still not functioning well. Now, you may have some inflammation, but those little airways at the very end are completely plugged up. Hence this term, organizing pneumonia. Remember, pneumonia is all the way down at the little leaf buds of the tree. And here's the cartoon again. You can have injury very low down in the bronchial tree, and then you can get inflammation that goes into those little leaf buds. So that gets the organizing pneumonia part of the bronchiolitis obliterans. So again, another problem that can occur after transplant, the x-rays and CAT scans are very distinct. They're fluffy infiltrates. This is not the same as what you would see in BOS, so that to your nurses, practitioners, and physicians, we should be able to make that distinction for you. Okay, we're going to finish up here over the next couple of slides and then get on to some questions. So what are some possible uh, causes of lung problems after transplant? Certainly chemotherapy and radiation can uh, injure your lungs. There could be hidden infections. So again, your care team is going to be carefully looking at a variety of different germs that could be in your lungs. What if it's the immune system gone wild? Again, this graft versus host disease. We know that graft versus host disease uh, affects our patients. Uh, some of our patients will get acute uh, and chronic lung injury, and there are connections between the two. So this has led us to whether or not uh, uh, understanding lung problems after transplant could be seeing it as a form of graft versus host disease. Now, in just a slide or two, I will say that we've used actually mouse models. We've actually transplant mice. Some of them have an identical twin. Some of them have a mismatched donor. And then we can look at the lungs of mice over the course of time. This is a very normal looking lung, but animals that get graft versus host disease have lungs that have many, many immune cells in them. And we and others have come to find 
and use these models to try to figure out what is driving lung injury and tumor necrosis factor happens to be a protein that we have identified that is associated with inflammation that may cause lung injury in mice and we have found that it is a big player of lung injury in humans both early and late. This looks like that bronchiolitis obliterans, right? This is actually a mouse lung, not a human lung. This is just one cartoon to suggest that in my mind, I don't think a chronic lung injury occurs overnight. I think this is a progression. The lungs can get injured early, and if that inflammation continues, even if it is silent, if it involves those small bronchi uh, 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 bronchial trees, you can get inflammation around those bronchioles, bronchiolitis. Sometimes it actually involves the fishnet network of the lungs. This can actually cause more stiffness of the lungs rather than obstruction. If we can intercept here, I think we have a better opportunity to slow down that inflammation before scarring of the lungs occurs. This is difficult, more difficult to treat, no question, but identifying these problems sooner than later uh, is going to be, uh, I think, in everyone's best interest. So what about our approach to patients? What are going to be some tests and procedures and consultants that you guys may see? History and physical exam, always important. We may want to assess oxygen levels, something called the pulse ox or a blood gas. Pulmonary function testing, you guys should at least won't be experts, but I wanted to kind of demystify some of that. X-rays, CAT scans, radiographic tests are going to be important. Consultation with specialists in pulmonary medicine. Sometimes procedures will include something called a bronchoscopy or a bronchoalveolar lavage. Has anyone in the room had a bronchoscopy for their lung problems? Putting a camera down into the windpipe, down into the branches of the tree, we can look around, see if there's inflammation, squirt some saline down into the lungs, suck up some of that fluid, and send that off for special tests. Rarely, we need to do lung biopsies to see if we can ultimately find out what is going on under the microscope. So it is very important for me and my colleagues to identify patients who may be high risk for lung problems and then really keep you uh, on the radar screen. This is going to involve meticulous and regular history and physical exams, but our history is only as good as you tell us. If we say, you guys have any problems, any cough, and, and, you, and you know you're coughing at home, but you're tough, eggs, you don't want to say, nah, I'm good. No, no, no. Let people know uh, if things are coming on, even if it doesn't seem to be that serious, because early recognition is going to be important. If not, I like, personally, to increase the surveillance to find subclinical lung dysfunction. So I'm a big advocate of doing pulmonary function tests a couple of times a year for the first couple of years because I want to see if the lungs are telling us something before clinical symptoms develop. If we see a drop in pulmonary function tests from baseline, I'm sure all of you have at least gotten PFTs before your transplant, then my ears go up and I want to spend a little bit more time doing some further evaluation. Now, if you come in and you're coughing and short of breath, I'm jumping right to this point right out of the gates. Now, what if we find infection? Well, then if we do, we're going to treat it. If not, is there any other evidence for systemic graft-versus-host disease? I'm going to be looking at your skin. I'm going to be looking at your joints, your fingernails, your mouth. I'm going to be asking you questions uh, about you know, how your other organ systems are working. Treatment. Steroids at minimum, unfortunately, and other supportive care options, but there are now been clinical trials that have been uh, completed and, uh, uh, and now published and some that are still ongoing. I mentioned before this medication, etanercept. This blocks this protein, TNF-alpha. Azithromycin is an antibiotic that uh, your physicians may have you on. There's a combination called FAM, or an inhaled steroid, this antibiotic azithromycin, and a medicine that reduces immune cell recruitment to the lung. And now there are other trials uh, that we'll talk about as we close. So what about from your perspective? No question. We need you to take good care of yourself. Smoking completely out. Now, I've never been a smoker. I understand that this could be a problem, but this is only going to irritate your lungs. 
This goes for our patients and the caregivers, right? And then, of course, when you're on immune suppression and you're having some issues with your lungs, we want to try to stay away from crowds and individuals who are ill to keep those infections uh, uh, away from us. I want you to ask your doctor and nurse about pulmonary function tests if you haven't had them in a while and let your team know about new breathing problems for sure. Uh, take prescribed medicines even when you're feeling well. If you're on Bactrim or Fluconazole or what have you, there could be a very good reason for that. What about the future? I want to leave you with some hope. I mentioned some clinical trials, uh, etanercept being one of them, uh, that I'll show you in a cartoon in a second that neutralizes this protein TNF-alpha. We've used it early and late after transplant and have seen some nice results. I mentioned this combination FAM, fluticasone, azithromycin, and monolucast. Easy to take. Uh, a paper just came out that showed you can get stability in your pulmonary function tests if they are low. There's a now a, a new drug out called abrutinib. This is being used for chronic graft-versus-host disease. There are other drugs out that we know that are coming around the pike that we will begin to look at in this setting. Now, here's some other hope. 2014, a whole bunch of experts, including myself, got together to talk about chronic graft-versus-host disease. We want you to know this is important to us. We're focusing on clinical trials and the diagnosis and updating the diagnosis and treatment of lung GVHD and updating the biology of chronic graft-versus-host disease. If we know what drives this problem, then we can target uh, new agents that may help uh, uh, treat and prevent it. And this is being generated using animal models, including our furry friend, the mouse. So here is a, uh, just a kind of a cartoon, some of the work that I've been blessed to be a part of when we're thinking about an injured lung. And it turned out that over the course of time, people in my laboratory and others, again, came up with the fact that this protein tumor necrosis factor, which can be neutralized by a drug called Enbrel, has actually been changing the standard of care for our patients, particularly those with acute lung injury. This was a little girl who had very inflamed lungs after transplant, and we put her on a clinical trial using this drug. And this actually was a Valentine's Day card. You can tell it's a little dated because I look much younger here. Uh, but this was really, this is what drives me to work every day, right? So this is about being on the cutting edge of uh, research to be able to do this. So here's our summary slide. Uh, lung problems are a significant problem. They can occur early or late. Uh, in each scenario, lung problems have a big impact on morbidity and mortality. This is important to you and it is important to us. It is not an easy problem to fix, but we are on it. We are developing animal models. We're coming up with new drugs, new clinical trials. We're trying to figure out if um, proteins like tumor necrosis factor that have a big, pro a big uh, role in acute lung injury may be a common thread to the development of chronic. We know that more needs to be done, but again, we're on it. The National Institutes of Health is funding a lot of this uh, research. We de uh, do need to have more randomized controlled clinical trials. We're looking at uh, blood biomarkers that may be able to identify the di and diagnosis uh, and early uh, identification of patients who are at risk. I, again, am a big believer of more frequent surveillance of pulmonary function. It's not an invasive test, and it may uh, be able to tell us that there are issues brewing before you all get sick. Here's a brief acknowledgement slide to my colleagues at the Johns Hopkins Chemical, uh, Chemical Cancer Center. My uh, heart, my hats go out and off to our patients and their families. Uh, this cannot be done, the work, uh, without funding support. And I will throw a, 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 a kudos out to the Cowden Foundation. Uh, uh, Jerry and Marty Cowden are here, uh, Cowden are here at this meeting um, this, uh, this weekend. So I'll end on my secrets to success. Remain passionate and committed. I don't care if you're in the medical field or not. Embrace teamwork and camaraderie. Find a good mentor and, and be one. Uh, this is my favorite, be too good to be ignored. I actually found this in a, a fortune cookie one, <laughs> one time. This came in late. This was actually from a dear, dear physician assistant who I worked with in Cleveland who said, Ken, you've got to find your happy place. And ultimately, we want to raise the standard. So our goal is to allow you guys to be in environments where outstanding clinical research really translates to the best clinical care. This is one of my happy places. I just got the goose pimples. If you've never been here, this is... Lake Tahoe in the winter. It is a beautiful place to be. These are my two boys. And, uh, you know, 
this gives a lot of perspective to things. So uh, thank you very much for your uh, attention. I will leave you with some spiritual food for thought as we uh, take some uh, questions. We certainly have some time to do so. So thanks again for coming out. And uh, again, thank you for your attention. All right. Thank you, Dr. Cook. Let's um, open it up to questions. Do we have any in the room? Start up front here. I've had CT scans. They had me do the walking test. And uh, <laughs> my, lungs, my lungs seem like they're not too bad. I'm, th I'm thinking I probably don't have a lot of scarring. I've asked, you know, if whatever damage is there, if it's going to get better. They said they, they thought it probably would. And yet, it's like the, any test that I've had so far, they haven't really... Well, I did do a, a heart test where they put me on a treadmill. They kind of pulled me off quick because I was breathing real hard, and then they did the, and I got some blockages in my arteries, but they said that's not really doing it because I pass out and stuff. But um, Then y yesterday, we're coming here, and I, I just had to put air in a tire, and I'm just pu holding the hose against the, the <laughs> valve. Yeah. And then you got to push the thing. And it, it's it just doing that, I couldn't do it. I get completely winded, and I'm just completely it can't do it. And I had to have her do it. I did. <laughs> and it, yet, you know, I can, like I'm sitting here, and I'm fine. I feel really good. But I just do a little thing, and it can be something where it looks like I'm doing nothing, you know, really, except I'm using my muscles. Yes, yes. And boom, I just have no air. Right. <laughs> and when you've done some of those tests, so you know, the, but none the, of them test me to that level. It seems, except for that the treadmill, we kind of yes. started getting there. But I could have gone further. It's weird. It's it's like it's like a it's like a um, where I'm, there's no movement actually, but my muscles are requiring oxygen because I'm pushing. You know, yes. And that's a big part about how the body works. I showed you a cartoon. So firstly, I, I can tell that you're struggling with this. Right? How far out from transplant are you now? Mm -hmm. Two years, right? So this is clearly a chronic problem. And when did all of this chronic in terms of the time from transplant, when did these symptoms first start? The, I'd say like six months ago, it wasn't that bad. And then it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. Uh, well, you know, I've got, I've got, I've, I'm on photophoresis therapy, and that's helped. And then I got an inhaler, and I got some other, I got a bunch of the stuff you're talking about. Yep. And uh, about a week and a half ago, I finally felt like when I took a deep breath, I could get oxygen, you know, because I, I, I get winded just walking across the room. Yes. Uh, and I finally felt like, I felt like, oh, it's there, you know. But it's felt good. That, it was like, a, it was like, uh, like your, a balloon that just wouldn't fill, you know, I just... It kind of panics you a little bit. Now, these are, terrib these are terrible feelings, I, and I only could uh, imagine them uh, from my side of the fence. But the, we take for granted being able to take a deep breath uh, and, and to actually get air in. I, I would, so it, uh, some of the things, when you are busy, when you're walking, when you're doing any kind of exertion, your body does need more oxygen. That's why I wanted to kind of show you that one cartoon where the oxygen has to come in all the way down at those little leaf buds, and the carbon dioxide goes out. So the more you are uh, pushing yourself, exercising, the more oxygen you need. So that's why sometimes when you're walking, have they done a, a, a walk test they can yep. sometimes do and measure right. your oxygen? Have they done those recently? Yep. And, they, and they've been they good. They've pretty good, yeah. Interesting. But now, you know, actually what I've started doing the last few days is you know, from the pulmonary test, you know, where they tell out, 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 out. Yep, yep, hurts. yep. I, I make sure that I just <laughs> exhale. Yeah. And then go like that. Yes. That's, I think that's helping me. Too. Now, sometimes if you go back, you can talk to your, uh, you can talk to your doc. Sometimes they will actually give you a puffer after you've done the test. So they'll make you do the test. And then they'll give you a puffer to see if they can relax your lungs a little bit and make you do the test again. That will also give us an idea if some of this would be more responsive to those asthma-like medicines. Right. So when you go back in, I would chat with your doctors and nurses and providers and say, hey, have they done these pulmonary tests with, you know, kind of a, an albuterol inhaler? Because that may also help kind of put their finger on what is going on. Okay. The other things to do, try to do your best 
to, you know, all of those things that you're probably doing already. Stay away from, you know, secondhand smoke. Uh, making yeah, sure you're trying to stay as healthy as possible. Like a week ago, my daughter told me to move in and all I did was I took a cooler that wasn't even very big and walked it up to my car, which is 20 feet from the door. And I had come back and I had to sit on the porch and take a breath before I came back in and then I got up and, 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 and that's after I now feel like I need to oxygen. Yeah. It's just such little effort you know, and, and exertion. I'll give you my card at the end of our discussion. If you'd want, I'd, I'd be happy to talk to your, to your docs to see if there are other medications that may help. Hang in there. Me? Oh, okay. Uh, I'm a, an 11-year uh, transplant survivor. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, while I was being treated, uh, I was unable to take Leviquin, so they put me on Dapsone. So my question is, are, is there any... And I had some chronic um, GVHD. I currently suffer with uh, cough variant asthma. Hmm. So I cough every day, all day long. I keep it under some control with asthma medicines. But my question is, is there any information on long term uh, from the use of Dapsone during G uh, transplants? So uh, none that I know of. Dapsone's, a, Dapsone's yeah. been around for a long, long time. Uh, it can cause problems with your red cells, hemolysis. So sometimes our he uh, we'll put patients on Dapsone and the hemoglobin will drop a little bit. But to my knowledge, and we don't use, Dapsone is usually kind of a third line drug, but sometimes it's actually still very effective. But to my knowledge, specifically to your question, I don't know of any long-term effects of Dapsone on pulmonary function. Uh, but is it, are you still on it, or did you just take it around the uh, transplant time? No, I just took it during the transplant yeah. time, and it worked. It kept me from getting pneumonia. Yes. So right. that, this that served its pur yes. purpose. Yes, yep, yep, absolutely. But I've, I've often wondered if the cough area and asthma wasn't somehow a consequence of it. Not to my or knowledge. Or some Not to my GVHD. Knowledge. And how are your pulmonary function tests? Do they kind of show up? Do you score well on them? Generally, I do part? pretty well on them. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Well, so good. I'm still breathing. Well, and listen, we, we've heard, uh, I was in a session earlier uh, that was talking about, um, you know, dealing with stress and dealing with frustration. And people do make some silly comments. But you, people might say, well, hey, you're still breathing. And you're like, well, I want to set the bar a little higher than that, right? <laughs> so, I, you know, but, but people, even when they're trying to do their best, sometimes say some silly things. But that came from you. So, but you, know, you look great and you're out 11 years, so... God bless. I don't know the uh, I don't know the answer to Dapsone. That's not something that I've uh, I've, I've heard of. But chronic GVHD, I'm sure, does result in some asthma symptoms. That can. That's yeah. right. The fact that it's responsive to your puffers and other medicines is really is really good because a lot of graft versus host disease of the lung, as I was mentioned, once there is scarring, it's not responsive. It becomes fixed. So those medicines don't, may not work as well. So the fact that you're getting some relief from that is actually a very good sign. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have a question in the back. I have a question about how do you have the conversation and which medical provider do you go to? I was diagnosed, I'm a 13 year survivor, but I was diagnosed at the age of 26 and I'm 40. So majority of the times I'm overlooked for conditions because of my age. I've had sinus infections years, years, finally had a sinu plasty mm. procedure uh, about two months ago. And then this month I ended up with another sinus infection and I've had a dry cough for about two or three months. So I'm trying to figure out how to have those conversations to get to this testing side to see if there is an issue with my lungs. Now when you're saying your age, my, I'm assuming it's your, maybe your time past transplants. People say, oh, well, you're a 14-year survivor. You know, you're, you're good, right? But, and you may be, but we want to continue to be focused on some of these issues that can be problematic even later. Do you still see anyone from your transplant team? even? Yes, I still see them every three months. And when I say my age, I really mean my age. I'm 40. Huh. <laughs> so it's a combination of both. It's how far I'm out from yep. transplant in addition to my age. I was diagnosed with multiple myeloma. So a lot of effects that comes with that disease, yes. they never look at a person my age and say, hey, we need to test for osteoporosis or arthritis and things like that. So because I get kind of looked case, over. Because in you're actually young for yeah. multiple. Mm -hmm. I got it. I got it. Mm -hmm. I would still be 
persistent with, it's good that you maintained a relationship. This is one of the things I love about being a transplant doctor, particularly in kids, because our patients, we never, we never mm -hmm. give them up. I mean, yeah. you might decide you might not want to come <laughs> back to see me, but I'm never going to say don't come. We love yeah. seeing patients grow up, do well. We want to see them not only on that survival curve, we want to see people thriving. We want to see people back to work, back to school. So we take these you know, we take these questions and concerns very seriously. I would go back and say, listen, you know, do we need, how do I go forward with getting some additional uh, workup, particularly if I'm having a little bit more of a chronic cough? Is this just residual sinus infection or is there something else going on? Okay. Uh, and I think if you continue to rattle the tree and you mentioned that you were at the symposium and you're learning mm -hmm. uh, a little bit of some of these long-term uh, effects that we have to pay attention to, uh, my guess is they're going to be able to step up and, and, and get you to the right people. Thank you. Can I have a couple of quick ones, of quick questions? Um, so I've been, I, I'm two and a half years out of the stem cell uh, transplant and a year and a half out of diagnosis of um, Obliterans, bron bronchiolus, bronchiolus, obliterans, and actually, BOS, one, right? yeah, yeah. one of the docs, uh, the team at Dana Farber, had put me on. Besides that, FAM, the erythromycin, um, is the imatinib, which mm -hmm. is a Gleevec. Yes, um, and that was about six months ago. So 200 milligrams of that a day. Um, how does that compare with the n and what do you think of that? Right. Yeah, great question. That, that's a, another medication. So interestingly enough, imatinib is a drug that is used uh, also for a certain type of chronic leukemia, uh, but it turns out that that has some anti-inflammatory properties as well. So there's at least one paper that demonstrates that imatinib could be used for patients with chronic graft-versus-host disease. Uh, it was a smaller paper, but there was some signal there in the lungs as well. Do you have chronic GVHD anywhere else? Yes. Uh, yeah. so, so it may be trying to get a, 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 couple, of, uh, a couple of hits with the uh, imatinib. It's generally reasonably well tolerated, so, and you're with a fantastic team. I actually did some of my training up there years ago, uh, so these guys are really kind of focused on it. Who's your, who's your doc up there? Anton. Joseph N. Yeah. He's the... Uh, He's the, He's the, the chief, founder. Yeah, chief, <laughs> great guy as well, very thoughtful. Yeah. Uh, so we actually participated with their group, at least in one of these trials, where we used the drug Etanercept. We have a, a publication probably about as big as the one that was out for imatinib. So I think you could use probably one or the other. If you're not getting uh, the effects that you'd like to see, I would bring that up with Dr. Anthony. What's the time frame for that? in terms of uh, uh, seeing effects. an effect. Yeah. Yeah, most times these things are going to take a little while. To, it's going to be months probably to see six if months. it's turning around. It's been six months yeah, since you've been, been on six it. Months. I think it might be worthwhile to go back and, and see if, uh, if he's willing to consider another medication if you haven't seen improvement at this point. Yeah. Um, so the lung function was when I first was diagnosed was like this, then it came up a little bit, mm -hmm. then it was stationary for a while, and now it's dripping down. So anyway, I want to catch it before it drips any further. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely, but, right, uh, because I can sense. Do you have emerald. a lot of symptoms? Do you feel short of breath when you're... Well, I'm, I used to be very athletic. I'm not very much anymore. I mean, I can functionally do stuff, but, you know, limited. Yeah. Like but it climbing. sounds like they're fo you're in a great place. They're following you closely, and they're thinking about some of these medicines that are, again, some of the newer uh, potential medicines for these Should issues. I bring up Enbrel? I mean, is it worth exploring? Okay. I would. If you looked at you like you had three heads, then uh, yeah. <laughs> you oh, could say, oh, that often. I, I met um, Dr. Cook. And do you suggest um, switching drugs out and in? I mean, some of these, um, like antiviral, antifungal, I've been, you know, people have been on for years and years. I mean, do you ever switch them out because somebody's become resistant to it? Yeah, so at least from the antimicrobial perspective, sometimes physicians will switch them around because you don't want the germs in your body to kind of become resistant. So if you switch them around, that's kind of a, a tactic to kind of prevent that from happening. So sometimes that will, that will actually occur. Sometimes the same can be uh, true for immune suppression, uh, depending upon how much uh, advantage you're getting out of one medicine or the other. But I think you're right on it. If you're watching your pulmonary tests, you're obviously getting them done with some frequency. Mm -hmm. Stability would be fine, but if you're seeing them go down again, you know, it really begs the question, is there something else you can do to kind of turn that around before you become 
more symptomatic. And of course, what we want to do is maintain or improve lung function. Right, and probably somebody else hopefully wants the answer to this. What's a bad oxygen level? <laughs> Well, I mean, is it 94, um, is it 95? Yeah, so great question. So I, I, I think, um, you know, a, a more, quote, normal uh, oxygen level, if you're measuring it in your fingers, generally above 95%. That's okay. I think we would like them to, at minimum, be above 90%. But if you're starting at 96 or 97 and you're drifting down to 92 or 93, that suggests that there's something going on. Uh, and that also may require some additional tests or maybe some supplemental oxygen when you're sleeping, for example, because if you're wide awake and your oxygen level in your finger is 90, while you're sleeping, that can drift lower. Mm -hmm. They can have effects on your heart and things of that nature. So generally, we like to have it above 95%. I think we would accept greater than 90. Uh, but generally speaking, you want to be like in that report card, you know, A, A plus range. And just one other question, and this is about exercise. Do you really push yourself? I mean, I'll push myself even though if I'm breathless. Well, I think it's like whether, whether we are just breathless because we're not in great shape or if we have something going on with our lungs, I think we want to make sure we, are, uh, we know ourselves, right? So there's a little bit of no pain, no gain. But at the same time, you don't want to push yourself too hard. Uh, you know, if you can push yourself to the point where... Uh, yeah, I'm going to get better and better every day. I think that is good. But again, I would know your own body and know not to go beyond you know, the limits. If you're really short of breath, it's probably time to walk if you're on a treadmill, catch your breath again, and then maybe start up once you're feeling a little better. That would be my general approach to uh, aerobic conditioning, whether you are well or whether you're a transplant survivor. Okay. Only one more question, um, and then Dr. Cook's going to stick around, and you can ask him some questions after. Okay. I, um, I had a uh, bone marrow transplant a year ago, and, but I also had heart problems. I had to get three stents, and that effect, I've always felt like that affected my breathing a lot because I always had a shortness of breath. Now, last month, um, my, just a general, my GP was, I was down there for my annual exam, and my blood, I mean, my oxygen was 85. So he, of course, has put me on oxygen. Uh, 24 hours at 3, so nobody told me what it might come from, though. Can this come from medication also? Can I have a oxygen level drop from medication? Yeah, what type of transplant did you have? Bone marrow transplant. I, was it uh, your own cells or something? It was my else's? brother's cells. It was your brother's cells. Well, as I, I hope you learned a little bit today, I mean, 85 is going to be as we were just discussing, below right. what I would think. Now, I'm a pediatrician, but I think I that's a little, it usually should be up around 95%. Right. So supplemental oxygen, as I was suggesting, would be the way to go. But the, better, the bigger question is what is going on there? Exactly. It doesn't seem, looking at you right now, that you have a bad infection, but are they doing some of those other tests that can help us identify are the lungs getting stiff? Are you having trouble getting air in or getting air out? And then if that is the yeah. case, what else can be done to try to turn oh, I've that had the, uh, the, in the phone booth thing, <laughs> yeah. or whatever you call it. I had that, like, because the minute this happened, um, my doctor here or in Chapel Hill, you've got to have this test. Yes. So I had that. And I think it was okay. As far as I know, my results came back okay. Uh, when I've you say two, as far as you know. Well, she sent it to me, and I don't know. It said everything was okay. So. All right, well, now you can go back and read it, right? I want you to look. <laughs> you have it printed out. I want you to look at those numbers, FVC, FEV1, right. TLC, and I want you to look at that percent. It will read like a report card. Yeah. And if it is good, then the question is, well, what else could be going on here? Exactly. Is it your heart again? The heart and lungs are going to work together to get oxygen down into the blood, then the heart's got to pump the oxygen around. Yeah. So I think 85%, I, I, would be, um, I would be vigilant about going and knocking on the door a couple of more I times. I haven't seen a pulmonary specialist. I figured that's the last result. Or well, I would move that up. I, I would think if, uh, if, you, you know, if, you're, if you're not getting um, answers that are at least helping you understand what might be causing that, yeah. that would be the next step, right? Yeah, because Get it'll to the go from 85, and then it'll be 92, and then, it, like this morning, it was 90, you know, and... So it, it goes back and forth. So. Yeah. My guess is there's, there could be something going on there, and you just okay. want to know uh, what that might be. Exactly. I, I would think 
Uh, I'm always very careful that a, you know, maybe a pulmonary doctor at this point would not be a bad idea. Okay. Those numbers are not reading as high on the report card as I think they should. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thanks again for okay. coming out. I hope you Thank enjoy you the rest of the day uh, and the rest of the symposium.